All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the invite. And thank you, Ross, for making all of the uh, logistics uh, very easy and, and smooth. Um, as Ross said, I'm going to talk about geographic data science and, and in particular how I see or how we've been working um, to help us understand cities better. But because I realize and I recognize that geographic data science, a term that for some people is not very common and for some is even or it might even be controversial. I've I've layered the talk in three three acts. The first one we're gonna see, or I'll cover a little bit of the background or where I think geographic data science comes from, and and what if any there is the the value of of calling it something that that we or calling or coining a new term that we didn't have a few years ago. Then we'll switch over to the second act, where I'll show you a couple of examples of what I consider geographic data science in, in action, making um, analysis of cities and, and helping, under, helping us understand cities a bit better. And then I also want to uh, include a little bit on this talk, somewhat related to the introduction, a, a couple of notes on how I, or why I think it's useful to what I call build community and how um, what are some of the projects that I've been involved and I am currently involved with, with more people to to make it easier for others to learn and to and to do data science and geographic data science. But uh, let's start from the beginning uh, background and where where does this idea of geographic data science come from? The, there's probably as many opinions as people or as many views rather than opinions as as people. Uh, the one I'm going to take here is one that we fleshed out with my colleague Jonathan Reeds that at the time was at King's College and now it's uh, at CASA at UCL in a paper a couple of years ago where we looked at how or we explored the relationship that geography has had with computers and with computation um, at least for the last 60, 70 years uh, which is really since modern computation started. And it's a whole paper that I, I, I'm not going to, to bore you with uh, entirely now. What I think it's useful from that uh, in the context of this talk is that we conceptualize the relationship between geography or how geographers have exploited and used and, and how the uh, how geographers have exploited and used computers, but also how the current computational technology of the time has influenced and has shaped to a certain extent the kind of geographical research that was possible and that was and that was done and the way we slice it in the paper is in three big phases of course these are not clear cut and these are not three there could be 30 or there could be two but we think three are useful one is what we call um, the era where you would find a computer in every institution on, or on campus or there would be one computer for all of the university and geographers would have to share computation time with physicists and with computer scientists, and there would be punch cards, and there would be a lot of trips around campus to uh, to the computational to the computer building where the the main computer was, and and things were very um, not smooth. But the big difference, particularly with the previous phase, was that. There was a computer that could do computations a lot faster than than uh, humans, and no, again, no causal relationship whatsoever. But it, this is also the time where the quantitative geo revolution um, had a, its peak, when geographers started thinking at models and natural or or models like those in the natural sciences to be applied to human geography problems. And, and cities were by no means an, an exception. And um, there's a lot that we could discuss that if you're interested, we can we can talk more in, in the question time. But this was the first time that where the main jump was from having to do uh, the calculations on pen and paper to having a machine that it wasn't very comfortable to use, but it was a lot faster. Then that spread and exploded in in many ways that pattern exploded in the uh, around the 80s and 90s when instead of uh, having one computer per university now we could find a computer almost in every office and these things were still not incredible by today's standards but it meant that everyone could have a machine to play with and that 
also compared to what had been before, computational power was was substantially bigger. And in fact, we identify in, in the paper these as the the time where the, the key technology that changed the way we think about or the way we we do geography uh, was the computer and computational power. And it's no surprise that around this time in the in the 80s is when GIS started appearing. Then early 90s, the GI science, the early GI science paper by Good Papers by Goodchild also came out. And later into the decade, particularly around the UK, there's um, the term geocomputation, which also started gaining traction. A lot of these, when you really read what what the people who set out these terms were thinking about, they were thinking about new ways of thinking that were enabled because we had computers that could do things that we couldn't do before. Of course, a lot of this was powered through data, but the, the key change that, at least for us, uh, was, was notable is that you could do things with the same data, roughly speaking, um, that you couldn't do before because we had these, these machines that, that we could start intellectually playing with and that spans that steps into the the new century the 21st century uh, where computers keep uh, growing growing in well in everything except in size and because they also start getting uh, smaller they start becoming much more pervasive and this is what we call the the phase of the um where you could find a computer on everything. And it's, it's a, a bit of a play with the idea of the Internet of Things, where we can plaster the physical world with sensors that um, that are capturing different aspects of, of the built or natural environment. And for us, one of the, the biggest switches uh, intellectually, but also technologically, is that of course, this is not the first time, but in a massive scale, at a massive scale, computers are becoming data generators. They're not only data processors, they're not only data analyzers, they're also, at a very pervasive way, data generators, because it is cheap uh, to put computers everywhere, and they are becoming small enough that can be put everywhere. They are being put in the form of sensors, in the form of smartphones, in the form of nano satellites that are constantly orbiting the Earth. And this starts generating amounts of data that are hard to compare with with previous phases and and what we this is more or less where we end the paper at is that hinting that the defining technological feature of the phase that we think or the era that we think that we are in now is not as much computational power or is not computational spa power as much as the ability that that computational power has to generate data and the the ability that that gives us to record measure and uh, analyze or describe the the real world um, in ways that we couldn't before. Now, of course, a lot of data by itself is not terribly useful, and and particularly large data sets. Uh, if you can't do much with them, they're they're useless. What we started realizing also is that we needed all of that computational power to process and analyze and to, to make to make sense of the data and. If you fast forward to somewhere in the towards the end of the first decade of the 21st century or around the early uh, 2010s, what we start seeing is the term um, data science. And there was a lot of buzz and to some extent there's a lot of hype around around data science in 2012, the, the ultimate proof that that something is overhyped is when it relates to data and and computers and math, and it's titled the sexiest job of the 21st century. And this did happen in, in 2012. Uh, this is a cover of the Harvard Business Review. What we think, however, is that if you get past the hype, there is actually some substance that is worth uh, paying attention and that there, the idea of data science, which originally was... Gener was um, a response really to, to a particular case of this idea that I was mentioning in the previous slide, uh, where sensors are generating automa in an automated way a lot of data, um, in particular where servers are creating a lot of logs of interaction with the server. Uh, that happened in the early tech, big tech giants of the of Silicon Valley around the 21st century, the beginning of the century. Um, that started expanding as, as more and more data was being generated in 
almost all aspects of, of life and definitely of, of science, that started generating a set of practices and a set of techniques and then also a set of specific questions that needed to be answered um, to be able to make sense of, of all of these data. And in most cases, I think what spurred the generation or the, the creation of data science wasn't that we had necessarily only more data that looked like the data we were used to before. It was that we had more data, but it was also that a lot of these data were very different in nature than the one than the data sets that we were used to. And this is definitely the case in in the sciences and in the social sciences, I I think. So early 2010s we're still calling this the, the sexist job. This is where uh, data scientists are featured in, in TV and, and so on. But if you get past the hype, five years later um, we start recognizing this as as something that that probably has legs and that we should be paying attention if we want to make the most of the new um, of the new era of computation that we're all now inhabiting in uh, or inhabiting. Sorry, and and uh, what you have on on the right hand side of the slide is um, a paper by David Donoho that's written on the back of one of his uh, presidential addresses, where it's a bit of a, a um, sort of challenging title, 50 years of data science. And, and what he really wanted to say is that data science, it's been sold as something completely new, but actually there's a long lineage of, of um, activities and, and different fields that have been doing parts of what we would today call data science. However, if you actually read the paper, he does say that there's a lot of value in calling something that uh, that brings together these disparate disciplines into something co coherent, that there is a lot of value in doing that. And and if you're interested in more on the, not the history as much as the conceptualization of data science, this is by far the most sober and, and useful definition and discussion of, of what data science is. And it's, to put it in so many words, it's a combination of statistics, of course, but also a bit of software engineering, a bit of information visualization, computer science and machine learning, which many people would argue is also statistics, but it's a very specific domain of statistics. Um, and then you bring all of that together in, in ways that are able to tap into current technology. So things like uh, cloud computation or, or um, bigger than desktop computers and um, non-graphical interfaces, etc. So this is this happened hard to, to pinpoint historically exactly, but somewhere in the early 2010s is where data science started becoming a thing. And, and in the second half of the decade, you start seeing programs on data science and and the, the field is becoming more institutionalized. What we started thinking, and we don't claim to be the first or the best ones, but we around then, around the 2015, um, we started also thinking that actually a lot of the data that, that the, you know, if you read a lot of the textbooks or a lot of the, the discussions around data science, there's this sense that the data happens in the ether, that all of the data that you use don't happen anywhere, that there are server logs and that you can analyze them as if they did, if they weren't geographical. But in fact, it's hard to know how much, but a large chunk of the data that is being generated today, particularly those through sensors, can be um, put back onto, can be pinpointed to a location on, on the surface of the earth. And that, that makes it spatial data or geographic data and that there is actually a lot of value in bringing everything that we know already about working with, with spatial and geographic data. So um, much of what we've been doing out of Liverpool for the last five, six years has been pushing this idea of geographic data science. Um, and actually this year officially got published, but we started working on the paper in 2015 when I first moved to Liverpool. Um, my colleague Alex Singleton and I started fleshing out this idea of, of a geographic data science not as a replacement for anything, not as a superposition onto anything that already existed, but actually as a as a space for cross pollination, as a space for interaction and for further um, collaboration between the newly emerging data science world and uh, the 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 discipline of geography and GI science that had been working on on problems and on challenges 
that had to do with very explicitly with dealing with uh, data that had a, a geographic location. So again, and uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the paper. If you're interested, we can discuss later in the questions. But what we propose is geographic data science, a field for cross-pollination that structure around three main pillars. And uh, these would be systems engineering, so building infrastructure for working with geographic data at scale. And, and this came because we realized that a lot of the new developments in data science were being modeled after data that didn't necessarily have um, a spatial dimension. And because, but at the same time, it was being used to work with spatial data. So we think there's a lot of value in baking in location into all of the infrastructure that, that you do. And, um, there's a few examples of, of these, but all of the database technology for working with big data that have a spatial uh, dimension is are good examples or uh, visualization toolkits that are able to, to visualize spatial data at scale, etc. would fall under the systems engineering pillar. The second one, which is what we're going to see mostly in the in the examples that I'll uh, cover in the next slides relates to modeling, to, to developing techniques or, or st statistical or machine learning techniques that take space as a first-class citizen that recognize that the location is an attribute, but also that it's an important aspect of the, of the process that we're trying to model or the outcome that we're trying to model. Again, this part of this came from us realizing that there was a lot of ad hoc modeling of space in, in what you would call data science, but it was in a pretty naive way. And, and in many ways, it was reinventing wheels that you know, in geography and GA science, we had been, we, you know, we had been aware of those issues for a long time and we had even proposed um, solutions. And then the final aspect is what we call data, the final pillar is what we call data-driven epistemology. And this is where the social scientists in us uh, come to shine. And we think there's a lot of value in geography informing much of the data science discussion from a social science perspective. And, and there's many ways that we can talk about this and we can discuss further. But the best way I have to summarize is that just because you can do something with a data set doesn't mean that you should. That there are aspects of ethics, there are aspects of privacy, there are aspects of um, representation that is worth considering and that we shouldn't take technology as the only um, as the only dimension to think whether we can do something or not that even if we can technologically do it do it in one way doesn't mean that we we should so hopefully that gives us a, a bit of a background on on where we see geographic data science coming in and 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 what a little bit of what it is at least a hint or or, or a brush of of how, of what are the main building blocks that we would we would consider as part of geographic data science. Now let's um, act two of the of the talk. This is a, a few examples on um, what I call geographic data science, and these are these come from. The, I'm going to show you three uh, papers, and as you will probably be guessing, in the interest of time, I'm going to be brushing very very quickly, and I'm going to try to highlight what I think is important about the paper and what I think is is novel in the sense that we could do because of this set of techniques that we probably couldn't before. Um, and if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to unpack any of these papers. All of these, all of them have been published, so you can check all the details on the paper. But if you have any specific questions, I'll be happy also to, to cover them. I have three examples, and each of them is, uh, it's a, representation or it's a it's a particular case of of broader um benefits that i think come with with doing geographic data science in a, in a very broad sense the first one is this idea of um method borrowing and in in actually in the geographic data science paper in the original gds paper we talk about three different uh, stages in which we could develop a field of cross-pollination and the first one is adapting uh, techniques from other fields into uh, geographical problems. And this is um, the first example, what I call method borrowing. This is a paper that we did a, a couple of years ago with, with a colleague from Liverpool, Francisco Rowe, and a couple of colleagues from the Office of National Statistics, 
where we set out to create a score or create a, an, an indicator of urban vegetation or public green space is, uh, is how we define it. The, the reason why we start, why we picked this is because, well, the ONS had a project to explore ways of measuring uh, urban vegetation in, way, in, in, in ways that, that were scalable and they didn't require sending a lot of people uh, around to, to take pictures or to, or to record a uh, presence of vegetation. But the, the bigger point is that consistent quantification of public green spaces is, is really hard to do at scale. And historically, most of that has been done um, by vast deployments of, of uh, human resources i.e. sending a lot of people to count or to record manually. And and this is hard to scale. It's very expensive. And because of those two things, it doesn't happen very often when it happens at all. It's really hard also to do it at national levels. However, or or the, the reason why we still thought that it was worth doing is that it, it's incredibly useful. Having We don't know much about how much green space our cities have and how, how much exposure when you go out to the street uh, you receive to, to green spaces, how much um, foliage you come across, how much um, plants, trees you you can access um, when, when you're interacting with urban spaces. And at the same time, there's a lot of re literature that tells us that, that we should get more of that. But it's hard to know whether you're doing more. Uh, all of the policymakers are saying that they want to increase, that they're trying to increase exposure to green space in cities. But it's really hard to, to quantify this if you don't know to begin with how much you have and, and where that is. So what we uh, did in this project was a pilot to see whether it would be, it would be viable to generate a score at a um, geographic, um, at an administrative sort of refined or finely grained uh, administrative unit, uh, whether we could develop a score of vegetation that gives us a sense of how much public green space uh, you could uh, you could experience or you would be exposed to if you went on the um, on the street. And to do this, we combined uh, we combined street level imagery that we sourced from Google Street View, and there's a whole set of interesting stories and anecdotes that came from that, but. Uh, we can leave that for the questions. And to scale it and make it consistent, we threw images through a deep neural network. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details. There's a lot of information on this slide, but I'll just walk you through the basic steps that we that we used um, in, in that paper. We took the, the input data was um, a sample of Google Street View images that had been sampled in an in an automated way, we built a pipeline to to ingest images from Google Street View at a equally spaced segments over streets. In this case, it was in Cardiff, in the, the Welsh capital. Once we had all those images, the thing with images is that they have a lot of information. We know this as, as humans, and when you look at an image, you can see that there's a lot of data about the built environment. The problem is that it's in an unstructured way, is that we can make sense of it, but for a computer, it's a bit of a trickier test. So we tried several approaches, and and by far the one that worked best, uh, which is perhaps unsurprising, and when you think in in hindsight, but that's that's the benefit of of hindsight. Uh, the one that worked best is is a um, a neural network that does scene parsing, so that is able to delineate lines within the image that encapsulate different uses and in particular some of the uses that we were getting were things from the built environment like houses buildings um, street furniture but also vegetation so things like trees grass plants bushes etc once we had that the rest was a bit easier in the traditional sense in that what we had was a set of measurements or a set of quantities for the presence of, of green space geolocated. And then we were able to pull from much of what the, the domains that I'm personally much more comfortable with traditionally, spatial econometrics and spatial modeling, to then derivate aggregates that give us a sense not only of, of the uh, that don't only give us a, a point estimate of the of the score, but they also give us a sense of uncertainty and that they aggregated at at areas that policymakers could could make sense 
um, could make sense of. So even though the original data was from about a quarter of a million images, that's actually not terribly useful for anyone other than for data geeks like me. But when you're talking to policymakers, it, it, it turns out it's much more easy to get your message across if you provide aggregates at um, administrative units that they're used to work with and that they can then connect to to census data or to other data sets that they may have. So that's what we did on the on the second stage where we threw a multi-level model and we can also talk about this. If you're interested, we created aggregate aggregate scores. So what we built effectively was a pipeline that went from input data that was images at the street level all the way to aggregate scores for areas full in a fully automated way. And we don't do it in the paper, but what we show and what we discuss and at the end of the paper is that this paves the way for generating much more um, accurate, scalable, and, and then um, potentially much more uh, frequent information about, about uh, green space in, in cities. The second example is, uh, or relates to another aspect that data science in general, I, I think I mentioned, and, and I think geographic data science too, uh, is uh, can claim, I think, as a, as a main benefit, in, is this idea of being able to tap into and, and make the most out of some of these new forms of data that I was mentioning before that have been uh, enabled because of the, the, the third stage of or, or this new era where computers not only analyze but also generate data in an automated way. Uh, this is a project that that ended up in a paper that came out earlier this year, or well, it came out last year, but officially this year in Computers, Environment, and Urban Systems, where we use a data set derived from the Foursquare social network. Foursquare is a is a social network where people can broadcast their location at a given point in time. Basically, it's a it's a square where you can where you're given a megaphone to say, I'm right here, right now. And you can say that to your friends, or you can say that to, to the entire internet. One of the interesting things that, that as a side effect happens when with Foursquare is that they've developed a, a gigantic catalog of venues and amenities in, in cities. And because the app is worldwide, um, this catalog also covers uh, many areas in, in the world, and it spans across different countries. So what we did with this paper was using what's called Foursquare check-in. So these, these uh, logs of people saying that they were at one venue at one particular point in time. Um, we use that to derive venues, so locations where people were going, whether they were restaurants or bars or, or museums. And then we also built or, or, or we used a, a flow matrix that connected these different venues based on the people that were visiting them both. So this allowed us to build a network of venues that was weighted by how often two venues were visited by the same people. And we used a, a community detection algorithm to then delineate groups of uh, venues or, or collections of venues that were visited by the same um, by the same people. And we did that in a geographically informed way which allowed us then to build what we call um, neighborhood boundaries. I mean, neighborhood is a very loaded term, so I take it in a very wide sense of the word. But what we were trying, what we were doing was delineating areas or portions of cities that contained venues that were visited by the same kind of people. And once we had these areas, once we had this cookie cutter to divide a city into different parts, what we did was looking at how... Uh, what what was what were these places like? What were what was the amount the diversity of venues? Were there places where they tend which tended to have just one place, one type of place, or many different types of venues mixed? Or we also looked at the morphology. What type of built environment was um, was featured in these in these places? And then we also looked at what was the mobility structure? So in these areas, how much and how often and how far were people who were using these venues moving around? And in doing so, this is one example. This is by no far, this is again, like most of the things in this, or most of the slides in this talk, a conversation starter. But it was a way of 
exploring the interaction between humans and built em, built environment and this is by no means an, an a new literature there's a huge amount of work on how humans perceive cities and how humans interact with the built environment but this was this provided as a uh, what we think is a a novel and and because it's so scalable a different way of looking at how people use cities at the end of the day so just as a quick example here is uh, four maps of the areas that we delimited so on the top left you have istanbul in in turkey on the top right there's seoul in in south korea and then below you have singapore and and chicago what you see is that these polygons aren't mutually exclusive and they aren't also fully exhaustive of of the space and i would argue that this is a feature not a bug of the application because what this relate what this allows us also to look at is to what extent some areas are more um or some boundaries are more clear cut or more uh blended or the transition between one type of area and another one is much more blended and these are some of the things that you can explore with 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 new new forms of data like the four square data set that we had in this example so that's example number two then example number three is this idea of developing new techniques and i alluded to this in in the previous part of the talk when i said that or, or I imply that one of the main pillars was modeling. Um, one of the goals that we set out in the uh, GDS paper with, with Singleton was that we envisioned geographic data science as being a space where first the two disciplines come and start borrowing from each other. But progressively, one of the things that we, we argue that, or one of the processes we argue that are most useful um, is not only being able to use existing off-the-shelf tools, but being also able to to integrate some of the ideas that made the tools that other fields use, and combine them with with some of the ideas that 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 made um, GI science methods and GI science concepts. So here is an example of something that's starting to go into that direction. Is not you know, arguably what we're doing is tweaking an algorithm. We're not developing a, a new one from, from scratch, but I think it's, it's a good example of, of, of these, um, process. Uh, this is a paper that came out, uh, also earlier this year that I, I worked on with a couple of economists from, from Spain, where we started with a very simple question, uh, by far nothing, I mean, by far as far as you can get from new, and in fact, it's, it's probably as, as old as, as cities, is this idea of where, where is the boundary of a city? Where does the city begin and where does the city end as it and unfolds onto the geographic landscape? And there's huge literature on this. So by this is, we didn't invent the question by any means, and we didn't um, gave a, a definitive answer. But what we think we did was providing a methodology that allows us to use data sets that have existed for a while but are becoming much more much more commonplace and in particular where we used building footprints so implicitly what we were saying is well we said it very explicitly there's different ways of delineating cities depending on what you're trying to do with those delineations in some cases you might want to uh, conceptualize cities as collections of interactions and flows, or other times you might want to consider them as, as built up area of certain density. And this is the way that the, this is the, the definition that we went with in this case. So we, what is the most fine grained way of, of looking at built up area is, is looking at building footprints and, and why we think this is an interesting data set a, because it's granular, but B because it's becoming much more, uh, commonplace. Um, in in Europe, at least, there are several countries that are starting to release official cadaster data sets, which include um, geographic information on every building unit in the entire country. But even for those countries that are not releasing these or they don't even have them, there's a lot of really exci exciting developments in, um, in the field of remote sensing that are starting to generate automated data sets that extract building footprints from, say, images from, from 
a satellite. And there's a couple of examples on that Microsoft released a few years ago for the entirely the entirety of the US and more recently Canada. And I think these were really just at the beginning of that of that era. So as as we move forward, there'll be more and, and better better releases of this type of data. Now the problem is that when you use building footprints in the case of Spain, what we had was 14 million points if you take every footprint as a, as a point. And what we wanted to do or what we wanted to find were clusters of points that delineated areas with high density of these points. And, and there's many ways. We, we went for a traditional method called DB scan, which looks at it's, it's a scan of, of the of what scans the space looking for areas of particular density. And it's, it's very popular. It's been around for almost 25 years. Um, what we found was that it a didn't scale to the size that we needed for this project, but also that it was deterministic. And then, well, that we didn't find that that's a, a feature of the algorithm. And we tweaked it in a way that allows us say, to run it for the 40 million points, but also uh, to explore to what extent these boundaries were hard boundaries or were much more porous. So we started with this 14, here is an image of the 14 million buildings that we had in Spain. And at the end of the, you know, there was some magic that we can talk about in the in the questions if you're interested. And at the end of the day, what we ended up with was uh, roughly 700 uh, cities, city polygons that when we then compared to administrative boundaries, um, metropolitan area boundaries, etc. So that's example number three. And then let's quickly move on to uh, Act three, uh, the one about community, where I wanted to end very quickly touching on some of the efforts that I, that I've been involved in the last few, and I am currently involved in over the last few years, to what I call build a community or to make it easier for people to to get integrated and and become part of the or become geographic data scientists and. and we think there's a lot of value in in broadening the community and and making it easier for people who wouldn't traditionally be considered a data scientist or GI scientist to to start using the tools and the uh, and the methods that that are being generated. So here there's here here are three examples that I have uh, have taken most or quite a sizable chunk of my time in the last few years. The first one is the, is the, is a course, the geographic data science course. Um, all of this is, is open license. So you can take it and do whatever you want, as long as you, you give credit where credit is due. This is, it's a website that it's structured around thematic blocks. So it, it, it uses, or it builds on the idea of learning of, um, learning objects, the idea that you can build course is almost like Lego pieces that then you can use and repurpose in different contexts. So the this was how I originally envisioned it and how the course is. It uses Python because I'm I'm a Python guy on the one hand, but also, I mean, I am a Python guy because I do think that it is um, the industry standard and, and probably the most useful language to learn for data science, at least today. And it's all structured around computational notebooks, which is, is the, the main vehicle for communicating data science these days. The second one is is the sort of the the older sibling of of the course is a book that I've uh, teamed up with Sergio Ray in at Riverside and Levi Wolf at Bristol, and that we're currently writing actually and and this is I think an, uh, one of the nice things of being able to write books in the twenty first century is that even publishers are starting to be okay with open data and with open. Uh, open licenses. So we signed the contract. There will be a, a, a paper book that you will be and hope some people will want to buy. But at the same time, and in the meantime, the book is already available online. It's a website and all of the materials, not only the exercises or the code, all of the book is available as, as a website where we're using uh, search, has been using these this mantra for a long time, this idea of using code as text, so using code as a pedagogical vehicle for communicating concepts, but we're also reversing it and using text as, as code. The book is, all of the text in the book is is really treated as code, is is built on on uh, computational notebooks, is being tested every time we make any change, and is treated as a software artifact effectively. And the book's coming later in the year, so stay tuned and, and 
there should be a, an actual book coming soon. And then the final one, this is a, a, a bit of a labor of love that I've been in, kind of working on the side for the better part of the last two or three years is, is what I call the GDSM. And, and I dub it as a containerized platform for geographic data science. The instigating motive for generating, for creating this or starting this project was that a lot of this technology, it's incredibly powerful and empowering, but only once it's installed and you're able to run it. And it turns out that that is not a trivial, is not a trivial task. And it's not a trivial task because it's a highly complex set of interconnected libraries that each of them are constantly changing. And when one changes, it, it affects others. And and this in itself, I think it's a fantastic thing that we have libraries that are constantly changing, being developed in the open and by different communities, but it does make it more complicated to stay up to date and to be able to run it on your machine. And and I think the, the traditional mantra of many open source developers, well, well, if it runs on my computer, what's the problem? And I think that's just not uh, acceptable anymore. If we want to to democratize access to to data science and geographic data science, we need to make sure that this is easy to run. And it, also, we need to make sure that it's easy to run in a variety of platforms. The, the traditional graphic user interface is based on the idea that everything happens on a desktop. But the reality of today is that you may develop or you may test things on a laptop, but then you might have to push them to the cloud or to a supercomputer that's running on campus. And we want to to lower the barriers to move from one to the other. So um, this project is is an ongoing effort and a labor of love very much in, in that direction. It's is is building a what's called a Docker image or a Docker container that incorporates all of the libraries or most of the libraries that I think are, are useful to, to do geographic data science, both in Python and R. And if you're interested, I'm, I could spend a long time doing uh, talking about this, but in the interest of time, I, I know I have 45 minutes, so uh, I'd rather wrap up. And if you're interested, we can pick it up on the, on the questions. So in summary, what this talk has done has is uh, proposing Geographic data science as a field or as a as a space for collaboration and cross fertilization between GI science and geography on the one hand and data science on on the other to avoid reinventing wheels and to make sure that everything that, and to make sure that the things that we already know are not forgotten and are being used where where they could be useful and we think or I think that there's a lot of potential in in this set of techniques and in in the result of or the outcomes of these. Um, interactions to help us understand uh, cities. And, and I think Serge, Serge Ray, the, one of my co-authors in the book, has this, this great uh, quote that, that says, well, there's a lot of people that say that data is the new oil, then data science is really the new refinery. And, you, you know, oil is useless if you can't do anything with it. The way you do something with it is by refining it. This, uh, the same goes for data. Data in itself is not useful. To to do something useful with it, you need to refine it, and that's data science. And for, for geographic data, we think there's a lot of, or, or for urban data or data that relates to cities, I think there's a lot of potential in, in, an, in tapping into new forms of data, but, but we need new techniques or we need to to bring together different techniques. And to do that, I think there is a lot of value in, in, in broadening the community and making sure that it's not only GI scientists, it's not only computer scientists, that it's it's more people. And to do that, we need to lower the barriers and hence some of the projects that I've that I've talked about. So here are some of the references on the papers that I've talked about. If, if you're interested, I can share the slides later in case you, you want to look at them. But for now, that is all and hopefully I'm I'm in time and I'm open for for questions and and discussion on any any aspect thank you very much